to kick things off, I wanted to start by asking you about your journey and motivations to drive change in the industry and why d is important to you. Tuvia, perhaps you can start us off on that. Yeah, so um, it's been what? It's been 18 years or so for me since I started my career as a baby lawyer. Um, and I will never forget back then, diversity inclusion was never talked about. And one of the worst incidents that ever stood out for me was a comment that was made for me in an interview with an American law firm at the time. Um, to just level set, uh, I came from a relatively poor family and had to work full time in order to put my work put myself through law school and one of the things that I did in order to be able to fund that was I was a flight attendant at the time and flew Toronto Tel Aviv every week so I think that's where I ended up learning uh, great time management skills and how to do things when you're <laughs> super super tired uh, and jet lag. Um, so I managed to secure an interview with an American firm. I was one of 10 students from Ontario to be able to secure an interview in New York with this firm. Um, and during the interview, I had two white men, which I presume were straight based on the conversation, turn about five to 10 minutes into this interview and tell me, you do realize that someone like you will never succeed in a place like ours, and you may want to just stick to flying the friendly skies. <sighs> it was the most heart-wrenching comment I could have possibly received at the time. You know, I did all the right things in law school. I had published in various legal journals. I, you know, despite working full time, I graduated at the top 10% of my class. And, you know, I realized I was different. I knew that. I didn't think anything said so in my CV, um, but I appreciate with my mannerisms and various other things, you know, someone could have possibly assumed. I didn't attend any of my other interviews that day and spent quite a few hours crying in the toilet. And I vowed that I was never going to allow that to happen to anyone else again. Um, and so after that, quite proudly, uh, was a squeaky wheel uh, and always very, very out. And, you know, I think fast forward to today, when I look at the fact that statistics show that almost 50% of university students go back into the closet when they enter the workforce is really, really shocking for me. You know, it's been two decades uh, I think the industry has come so far, organizations are doing so much to drive diversity, fly flags, um, you know, have a number of mentorship and sponsorship programs. Um, and despite that, you know, students still fear, certainly from an LGBT perspective, to really present who they are. So um, I've made it my mission to kind of stand up and go, no matter who you are, you are very, very welcome because it's a, it's, it's, you know, law is a client focused industry and different clients need different types of lawyers. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting, those kind of stories of adversity that, you know, at the time, probably not the most pleasant to go through, but actually helps you later on in life and drives and makes you more determined than ever. Um, what about you, Emma? What, what's your story? Um, so I guess mine's a little bit different. I'm from um, a very small town in Northern Ireland um, called Ballyclare. And uh, I grew up, uh, I'm a farmer's daughter. Um, my mum's a PE teacher. So law seemed like a very alien thing to me, but I'm, I'm kind of, you know, a slightly bookish child, bookish and sporty. <laughs> and uh, I guess I, I think I was really fortunate. I've thought about this a lot because people have said, why are you confident to speak up? And I think, no one ever told me not to, right? So I think when I, when the teacher said, you know, you should apply to Oxford, I remember saying to my parents, oh, they said I should apply to Oxford. And, you know, my father who didn't go to university was like, oh, okay, that sounds like a good idea. Why not? So I did. <laughs> and then when I got to Oxford, I, um, I studied French law in Paris for a year. I've always loved to travel. So when I, when I was a teenager, I, I guess I did say to my parents, I'm going to go off to Germany when I was 15 and 16. I go and work other countries, I love languages. So when I thought about um, choosing a law firm, Clifford Chance had sponsored my year in Paris. Uh, it was an incredibly diverse firm, super international. So I was like, well, I'm gonna go to the firm that is the most diverse, the most global I can find. And the thing I loved about Clifford Chance, and I still do, is there was no type. 
no, we don't have a type. There is no type. Some of the other firms I interviewed at, they were like, oh, you went to Oxford and you played rugby and you got a blue and we know your friend who's doing really well. And I was like, well, don't hire me because of that. Like, <laughs> hire me because um, you think I'm a good candidate and you've tested that. Um, and so Clifford Chance had some crazy like full assessment day where you had to build bridges out of straws and I perversely thought that was a much more meritocratic entrance system. <laughs> um, so I kind of, I like to go for the thing that's not necessarily the same as everyone else. I've always liked that. Um, and then in terms of why it's so important to me as the practice area leader for our financial markets team here in London, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a passionate feminist. Um, I'm a mother of, of two kids. I've been hugely supported throughout my entire career by a range of role models, not just female partners, but male partners, people of different shapes, sizes, colors, backgrounds. And I think, you know, diversity of thought, as Tuvia said, is the most important thing that we can bring together. So different viewpoints, different experiences. It's A, it's really fun. You know, it's really interesting to meet people in our team here in London. We've got people from Portugal, people from the Ukraine, people from Australia. Um, and I love that as a working environment. And, you know, I want a law firm's a little bit like a sort of extended family. It's like a big, big community. And I want everyone to feel welcome here. Um, I want everyone to succeed. And from a business perspective, clearly, I want the best talent in our firm. I think we have it. Um, but I also want to particularly um, promote and retain um, talented individuals. And I really, really passionately don't want anyone to be turned off for the wrong reasons. Um, so I, I really do, I know there's not necessarily a meritocracy or a level playing field, but I really, really want within Clifford Chance to see if we can try to create that and support people as much as possible. Um, and I guess lastly, I think I grew up in um, Northern Ireland, I guess, I was born in the 1970s. So I'm very, very aware of how you can other people um, and create a civil war. So I'm very anti-silos, I'm very anti-labels. Um, and so, for me, the diversity piece has been slightly troubling because I don't want to sort of think that, you know, Tuvia is a gay man and I'm a white woman. I kind of just want to think about Tuvia and Emma and everyone in that context. So for me, one of the interesting things in this space is diversity and inclusion. So really thinking about bringing people together, but acknowledging that they have different, you know, backgrounds and understanding what that might mean for them, but equally kind of trying to bring everyone together. How do you think the kind of prospective candidates can tell the difference? I mean, between the companies Ooh. truly serious about the DNI. That's a great question. That's <laughs> a really great question. And the ones that are just kind of paying lip service. The service. Yeah. Look, I love the way you say that, right? It is about the lived experience. And that's that's where the difference is. There's the corporate hymn sheet, and you can read beautiful brochures and great websites and go to talks, right? But at the end of the day, it's about talking to people and talking to people at the law firm, talking to people at the, you know, in the in-house team. The more people you talk to, you really start getting a sense of what the culture is like. And is it just paying lip service or is it actually genuine? And to be honest with you, I think one of the greatest things, I know for me at least, that I spend time telling people is I tell them, you know, where we get it wrong because yeah. you're not always gonna get it perfect. And actually, I think those organizations where you have people say, look, I know we try really hard and we get this. Are there going to be some bad apples? Yeah, that's a reality. That's just life, right? But just because you sometimes have some bad apples, it's not representative of the entire organization. And if people can put up their hands and say, look, this is where we get it really, really great. This is where we're still working on it. I think that honesty goes to the trust point that you mentioned, Emma, right? Yeah. And that's where you really know that an organization truly cares about creating that, you know, that family fabric. From the manager's perspective, if they are managing people that are completely different backgrounds to, to what they are, do you have any advice as to how they can come across as or be more empathetic, um, even though, you know, they've got very different lived experiences? As a, as a leader though, it's my responsibility if I do my job right to know my people and to learn to understand my people. The onus is on me to do that. And so I think, you know, one of the things we always talk about is authentic leadership. 
right? And how can you have authentic leadership if you're not being willing to be open to talk about your experiences as a leader and your challenges, but likewise then to create a safe space where you can listen to your people and to get to know them. And that's really what this comes down to, right? We should all be spending time with our people to understand what their day-to-day -day lives look like, what their challenges are, what their realities are, because that's the only way that we also know that we can help support them to get the best out of them, right? So there's the business incentive for that. But if you get the best out of your people, they will be committed and they will be happier. And so if I think about the pandemic, and I know, you know there are a lot of negative things that came out of the pandemic. I think one of the things that's really shown through for a lot of leaders as well, and a lot of teams, is the real authenticity, right? Kind of that veneer or that uniform has dropped away. People living at home, we start seeing the real people, not you know their corporate uniform selves. And you find that a lot of leaders and managers have spent more time talking to their people because of a, a function of the environment to be able to get through and to share some of the challenges that everyone's been having. And so it, it comes down to that understanding and having a you know real conversation. And, and to be honest, I think that's one of the things that's historically scares people sometimes to really have a real conversation, sometimes hear things that might make us uncomfortable, but I think uncomfortable is a good thing. Yeah, and one of the vulnerable as well. I mean, I, I think we find it slightly more difficult in some ways because I think in the in the pandemic, you know, one of the things that many, many partners have said to me is they really miss just being able to pop in, like put their head around someone's door and check that they're OK. You know, just do that kind of floor walk in the evening, see who's here, make sure they're OK, see if they need some help. You know, people going for dinner together, you know, um, I think the camaraderie that the teams have, that's been quite difficult. So for me as a leader, you know, it's harder to see on a day to day basis how people are doing you know remotely and and that's been difficult and obviously people have had to deal with all sorts of personal challenges um in terms of you know caring for elderly parents and um you know children and, and, and so there's been a lot going on in people's lives and um now that we're back in the office a bit more often you know I find out that someone who hadn't worked with recently got engaged so there's a lot of things that you know you don't necessarily pick up in a virtual environment when you're not sort of working immediately with that individual um, but I, I agree with you generally speaking to be that the, the personal relationships are the glue that hold the, you know the firm together and um, and I think to the point you asked I guess it's also it seems to me that it's also about expressing that publicly a bit more. I think a lot of people, um, you know, again, are good people, but have they um, been sort of vocal in their support or their active inclusion? Um, and I think, you know, if you think about partners in particular, because I guess we're kind of the middle managers in this piece within a, within a law firm, there are a lot of demands on partners' time. You know, they're winning business, they're executing business, they're managing teams, they're 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 billing, they're thought leading. So they they have many 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 hats. Um, and I think it seems to me that one of the issues is that maybe being neutral for some people is fine, but for others who perhaps have greater needs for support they read that as as negative um so I don't know what you guys think on that but I, it's it's something I've been grappling with a lot um how we how we kind of become more open and I think to be honest there's been a massive generational shift in that dialogue and it's become more part of the corporate environment than it was to, when I was a trainee um which I think is a good thing in some ways but I think it's harder for some people to respond to Absolutely. There's something I want to go back to that you mentioned around the challenges of the pandemic and that it's made it harder. I found it that it actually brought my team closer together, right? And it just shows we all have different experiences through it. But, mm. you know, at the start of the pandemic, I, I still, you know, was a practicing attorney um, and was heading up a team in-house. Um, and one of the things that I know I was adamant about was this whole check-in and how you do the check-in and how you keep some of the camaraderie going. And so we did um, 
at first it was forced, but I think people really bought into it. There was two twice a day check-ins. So first thing in the morning and end of day, and it was never to talk about anything work. It was never to talk about anything COVID. Neither was a yeah. And what turned around and worked really well for our team is every morning we played uh, Two Truths and a Lie. And we went around and you had, cool. and you started learning things about people that, you know, in the office, yes, you've got the banter and you turn around and you talk about, you know, clients or things that are going on or what you did on the weekend, but you don't always get the same information that you get, you know, playing this two truths and a lie, <laughs> um, which was brilliant doing that for weeks on end. And interestingly, <laughs> at the end of the day, we turned to doing various singing competitions, oh, uh, various other things, which was just, it, you know, across all levels, everyone was just equal and it just really broke it down. And if I think back, I realized that I got to know things about people in my team in a way that had we been in the office, I, I never would have. Um, and I really cherish and value that. So I guess in terms of taking it back with regards to the hiring process and mm. attracting talent, what do you think interviewers need to be mindful of when selecting candidates and how can they best address unconscious bias? Tovia, perhaps you can take that. Yeah, look, I think unconscious bias, let's be very clear, is not someone intentionally trying to do something bad, right? And I meet a lot of people who are in shock when after the fact they realize they might have, you know, you point out, oh, did you realize you said something and it could have been offended? And they would have never known because they're not ill willing, right? Um, so, you know, there are some interesting things that um, we've done at Goldman, you know, which I'm really proud of from a um, LGBT perspective, it's looking at some of our internships, which is that we, we brought in interviewers that were members of the LGBT network. So they were either LGBT themselves or they were allies to the network. So they were very well versed and attended. So you, and given everyone's voice is a valid voice through the interview process, actually selecting a broad range of interviewers from the network meant that it was one way for us to possibly look at addressing potential unconscious bias. You know, is somebody going to look at an interview candidate and go, ooh, some of their mannerisms or, you know, their hairstyle or the way they dressed? You know, the, the assumption there is, is that for members of the LGBT network, whether they themselves identified as LGBT or they were allies, that was already a bit more normalized, so it, it wouldn't phase. Um, through some of the hiring that we did, you know, on dedicated programming, candidates had already come out by applying through an LGBT stream. And so actually took away a lot of their fears and their pressures of, am I gonna be found out? Do I need to come out? How are people going to react? When in fact, actually the comment was, we want you, right? It doesn't matter that you're LGBT. This is a dedicated stream in to talk to you, to interview you, knowing that you're LGBT. So forget about that. That shouldn't be a concern. Um, so that was, you know, one way that we've done it. And I've seen that work really, really well across varied programs, whether you do it looking at, you know, socioeconomic uh, diversity or other things, because the other thing that interviewers are then doing is they're comparing like for like, right? Which helps as well. And so you don't end up in a situation that you are looking at somebody who um, is more socioeconomically diverse and comparing them to someone who both of their parents work in the city, both of them partners at law firms, you know, they will present very differently. And so you want to level that interview. Yeah, yeah. I think that's right. I mean, within Cover Chance, we've run um, our trainee hiring scheme has been CV blind for quite a while now. I think we're one of the first firms to do that. So we've, we're, we're very much um, focused on the, the partner and associates interviewing the candidate, doing it through a very structured interview. So we find that using structured questions um, and also having kind of, you know, a situational kind of um, structured question um, that people prepare and then work through um, is a much better way of interviewing than sort of an old style chat uh, where people sort of discovered that they had something in common or they went to the same university or, you know, they know, you know, they have more, um, I guess, touch points, which make them feel more comfortable with that individual. So we moved away from that 
a long time ago. Um, maybe as I said at the beginning, when I was tested, it was all very much based on certain skill sets. So we think that's that's incredibly um, important. Um, to Tupia's point, um, one of my favorite interviews that I've done in the last few years, I hope he doesn't mind if I say this, was um, a lateral associate who joined us. He had been at a previous um, law firm and then had been in house. And when I asked him why Clifford Chance, he said, well, I just um, absolutely love your LGBT network. I've come to lots of your events. I think, you know, Clifford Chance is, and, you know, he told me like himself and his background and uh, various people he knew. And so, you know, that's also great. So I think a lot of the stuff that we do in this in this space is, is helpful. Um, so my, I guess from my perspective, um, attraction and recruitment, I think are, less of the issue than perhaps retention and promotion, okay. uh, which is probably where um, looking at, you know, pa partner candidates in particular, that's a huge focus for us. What do you think the challenges are in kind of in integrating and developing potential lead, uh, kind of the underrepresentative lawyers into firms like CC and uh, Goldman Sachs? I don't um, think say, um, I don't know if you think, I don't think the initial integration is the problem. Right. I think the the entry is always great and there's a lot put around that to make it work. For some reason there seems to be a divergence then through someone's career trajectory. Um, and that's where you know you your point is on the, the retention piece. So they're fully integrated. Um, it's it's the next part of their career journey, really. Sometimes, though, I think the entry can be a little bit difficult. So, for example, when hiring experienced lawyers, how can you persuade, you know, hiring managers to look beyond the tightly defined skill set and hire the candidates from underrepresented backgrounds based on their potential? I guess, um, I mean, I guess we have sort of two main routes into the firm. Um, when you're hiring um associates, you know, qualified lawyers, you know, a lot of that is to do with skill set, right? And it's got to do with work, relevant experience. So that's more difficult. I mean, we are very open geographically. We're very open to people from, you know, different jurisdictions, different qualifications, but, um, you know, they need to have a very strong interest in the area of law that, you know, we do and preferably relevant experience in that area. I think at the graduate level, um, I think, you know, again, we are not, um, we don't have any kind of you know, prescriptive university or background route into the firm. Um, so I think we're pretty open on that. And we work with a lot of organizations like Rare and so on, who, um, you know, help support people from um, different backgrounds into, into law. Because one of the things that I always think, um, you know, particularly about somewhere like Oxford or Cambridge or, or Clifford Chance or Goldman Sachs is that we can only look at the people who apply, right? And, and if, you know, if my school hadn't suggested I applied, I wouldn't have applied. But if equally, if I'd gone to a school where they said, oh no, definitely don't apply. They won't take anyone like you. Um, you won't fit in there. They don't like, you know, they don't like, um, you know, people from Northern Ireland or whatever, then I wouldn't have applied. So I do think there's a big um, point around um, encouraging and supporting, but I don't necessarily think that in terms of when someone turns up on our doorstep, we would necessarily assess them differently, if that makes sense. I think the lateral point's an interesting one, and the managers that get it right are the ones that sit there and, you know, yes, skill set's obviously key, but then it goes to, are they going to be a cultural fit, right? And in organizations like CC and in organizations like Goldman and in others, right? Culture means different people and different perspectives and having those voices, right? And yes, I think there may be opinions from the outside as to what we as organizations may be like, but the reality is, is we do have very strong cultures and, you know, fabrics. Um, and so that diversity piece is actually really, really, important because you know when I love the way I'm described as a family I I always tell people you spend more time with your colleagues a day than the people that you choose to spend your life with you know and so you want to make it a great working environment and then if you add all of the pressures and the stress of the hours that you keep especially in private practice right because it's 
so much more cushier in house, as they say. <laughs> um, you know, working under those stressful situations and late into the night and whatnot, you need to be able to work with people that you're just going to get on with, right? And that no matter how stressful a situation is, you can have a good laugh and have, you know, de-stress. And so it's, it's, I think a lot of managers now are very, very focused on not just the fact that it's a skill set, but that the people are going to gel and work well to create a great working environment. And let me front run that I suspect you may say that not every organization is going to be like that, right? And there will be managers who don't think that and only will hire, you know, in their own reflection. My comment, and my comment always has been to diverse talent is, well, if that's the case, then why would you ever want to go there anyway? Because it's yeah. not going to be the type of place that you're probably going to thrive. Mm -hmm. So if that's the culture, just that's not the place for you. And that's okay. Go be somewhere where you're actually going to get to grow and flourish and be yourself. But how can organizations have that individualized approach when they're, you know, multi, you know, when they're global, like Goldman and Clifford Chance? That comes down to the leaders, mm -hmm. right? And that comes down to good management, right? Top of the house, I think, needs to be supportive and say that we believe in authenticity. And I think I believe. I think talking about diversity is, is the wrong thing because I think we need to talk about authenticity because then you include everybody. Everyone's got something different that they need to have unlocked to make them succeed, right? So I, I, I love authenticity over diversity. And then it's incumbent on me and managers to then get to know your people and understand their challenges and what's going to bring out their best and to help them succeed and where they think their challenges are, because then you as their manager, as their leader can help support and see their perspective. You can overlay what you think um, and find the right path for them, right? But look, that takes a lot of time. Like, let's be honest about that. And, you know, we, we sometimes automatically think that just because someone becomes a subject matter expert and becomes more senior, that means they're going to make a great leader and a great people manager. And that's not the case, right? And so right. I think spending time, one, really figuring out who are good people managers and understand how to develop talent and then giving them support. And one of the biggest things I think to give them support, especially in the legal industry, which doesn't happen, is give people the time and the headspace to be able to spend that time with their people to help develop that. But um, you know, with deals coming down and the pressures, and you know, having to find headcount efficiencies and you know, billable targets, I'm sure, um, you know, for partners and associates, um, that's not built into the model right now.